Hello, gang. Welcome back to the Baseball Pandemic Book Club. Oh, man, we've got a special episode installment today. We're talking poetry. Oh, no, don't run from the room yet. Poetry. It's good. It's good. And it's going to be good in terms of baseball. And we've got some great esteemed poets with us today. Let me introduce uh, them. We've got, first of all, E. Ethelbert Miller. Man, this guy wears a lot of hats. And he's got a very nice lid on right now. He's a poet. He's a teacher. He's a literary activist. He's based in Washington, D.C., uh, he's the author of several collections of poetry. We'll get to those in just a minute. Two memoirs. He's an editor of Poet, uh, Poet Lore. Yeah, Poet Lore magazine and host of his own morning show uh, on the margin, which I highly recommend. He was born in the Bronx and his collections of poetry include, I love these titles, If God Invented Baseball and Your Wife Has Tommy John Surgery and Other Baseball Stories. He's currently finishing up his third book of this baseball trilogy, How I Found Love Behind the Catcher's Mask. Oh, we're looking forward to that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, he's joined today and, and I'm feeling these guys are all decked out. And I'm kind of looking like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, casual guy on Friday. But Dean Smith is the director of the Duke University Press. So we've got to get maybe into this a little bit, especially this type of day. You know, this time of year, Duke versus UNC and basketball. I don't know. I don't know how you do it, Dean. But uh, he's director of Duke University Press. His career in publishing spans more than 30 years and includes experience in scholarly, university presses, trade, and association based publishing. He's from Baltimore, which will become apparent in just a moment. He's a lifelong Ravens and Orioles fan. He has two great poetry collections, American Boy and the recently released Baltimore Sons, which I highly, highly recommend. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. Thank you um, for the invitation. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Let's start with just a couple of questions, but I think uh, viewers, listeners, whatever, we're going to do things a little bit different uh, uh, as we get into this. We've got two poets, so we're going to let them do a lot of poetry, and we're, we're going to do that. But first, let's start with a couple of questions, and I, can, I want to kind of prime the pump here a little bit for some viewers. Ethel, but let's start with you. Why is poetry important to the world? What do you say to some people going, ah, poetry, who cares? Why is it important? Well, I think if you want to ask yourself why poetry is important, all you have to do is look at the headlines and watch the news. Um, you know, what's coming out of Ukraine um, has had everybody concerned about, uh, you know, loved ones. And I think that when we talk about what poetry does, uh, poetry, I think, comes from the heart and speaks to the heart. Um, I always talk about the importance of, of talking and writing about love. And that's sort of to have that type of language to push the back against the darkness. And um, many times what you find is that poetry is provides comfort. You know, I've written a couple of poems about Ukraine uh, and some of those poems actually reach the Ukrainian community. Uh, and people are very happy to, to have these words and realize that, okay, they're not forgotten, they're not invisible. And so in this sense, you know, poetry is that sort of, at this time, a lifeline uh, to people. Very good. Dean, you want to add anything then on that? And also why is poetry maybe crucial to the game of baseball, if you want to go off on that. You know, thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that has been increasingly diminished is the, this idea of an inner life. You know, you can, everything is sort of rapid fire. It's a tweet. It's a, you know, and I find myself running to my books of poetry, to uh, Charles Wright, to Gwendolyn Brooks, to uh, Sylvia Plath, to kind of find solace. You know, that it's a place where you can, you can achieve calm and, and peace and, and get into something that's that's not you know, the noise of the world kind of goes away. And similar to what um, Ethelbert was saying, you know, someone uh, messaged me last night and said something like, what will tomorrow's outrage be? And then to hear that it's just the idea of tomorrow's outrage as a poem, uh, you, you know, you're listening even in the newscast for these ways that things get um, described and and one of a word recently that I've heard is invisibilized. What a beautiful, beautiful word to like think about putting in a poem. Um, so when you, you know, I'm sure Ethel, Ethelbert does this as well, but you know, why is it important to poetry? You know, you've got poems, look, you know, the there's no joy in Mudville. Uh, you, you know, you've got some great baseball poetry out there. 
Um, but there are lines. There are. This is something that happens outside of time. You know, I find myself when I'm writing poems, four hours can can go away, and and I won't even know where I in a revision if I, I can get involved in in that. And time just everything slips away. So I think it's important for for us to be able to replenish ourselves and to to have an inside look at at what someone the innermost someone's innermost thoughts. Uh, very good. It sounds like watching a good baseball game. It kind of <laughs> re-energizes us and time stands still. Ethelbert, would you like to read us a poem and start us start us off? And yeah, I'll read a poem that's um, from the forthcoming collection, "How I Found Love Behind the Catcher's Mask," which this is a is great a, great title, by the way. <laughs> and this is a poem um, in the voice of Ken Griffey Sr. Even before my son turns his cap backwards. I wanted to keep him close, keep an eye on him. I didn't want the world beyond the outfield like other fathers. I love watching my son play, the way he watched me play or when we played together before the love of the game, there was family. And how we loved each other was how we hit when other men were on base. There were times when his injuries made me close my eyes, but my eyes could never close after seeing the beauty of his swing or the catches made near the wall Baseball was good to us. History will remember us because we made history. My son's Hall of Fame smile, another RBI for the record books. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. I know that the poets still do this. Is, is that... <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, a, a nouveau poet. But you know, I, I tell you why, why I like this, this poem. <laughs> Uh, Tim, you know, one is is uh, it, how my I try to get the poems to move beyond baseball, and in the first stanza, you know, keep an eye on him. I didn't want to worry beyond the outfield like other fathers. You know, that whole concern in terms of black fathers and black sons, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I always think about how um, Griffey Senior saw his son like injured, um, but so many other fathers saw their sons killed. Mm. You know? And so what happens is that, you know, I like this poem because it moves beyond baseball into the whole thing of father-son relationships. Yeah, no, it's, it's beautiful. And I like the, the Hall of Fame smile. I mean, that, right, that's, that's right. a great poet. Yeah. Uh, poem. I remember years ago, go off on a tangent here a little bit, I was covering, I was in Seattle covering the Mariners for Baseball Weekly. And um and Ken Griffey Jr. was the only one who could get away with this, I think, in the clubhouse. Everybody's had kind of stools or maybe a nicer chair. He had like a lazy boy recliner with massage <laughs> things going on. And uh, and he let me sit in it and just relax there for a while. And um, it was great. <laughs> it was better than my hotel bed. <laughs> uh, Dean, will you please read us a poem? Sure. No, I, first I want to say I love that poem, Ethelbert, and I love the idea of it, the perspective of coming from Ken Griffey Sr. And I can still see him bat, at that, you know, and mm -hmm. he had a very yeah. distinctive stance as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as an Oriole fan saw many of his son's home runs rocket out of Camden Yards, <laughs> like <laughs> 100 miles an hour. I, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think he hit, he definitely hit the Utah street, but maybe not the, he maybe came close to hitting the building. I, I don't know, but well, I think he hit the warehouse during batting practice, yeah, yeah. that, that home run derby thing. Cause I was out there and, uh, so yeah, yeah, he, he did it, do it then, did it then. I am, in fact, not to interrupt too much. Griffey loved to play in Camden. I think if they had him in Camden, he'd be even higher up on the all time home run leader. But anyway, I digress, please. Sure. Uh, so this is a poem about my son. Shotgun. I drive my son to t-ball games past the bank where mom cashed in our savings bonds for Fruit Loops, PF Flyers, and Chef Boyardee. The boys' determined swings occur a few blocks from where I was conceived by mistake in the back seat of a royal blue Thunderbird near the house where my grandfather taught me to hit baseballs. He would sweat into an undershirt and work pants before the night shift at Sparrows Point. My son swats the ball into a riotous scrum and tears around the bases, unaware of his origins, his ancestors, the trees waving him home. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And then I hope everybody gets to meet Quinn someday. He's quite the kid. <laughs> um, that allows us, you know, to pivot just a bit. 
both of you guys, you know, I, I want to hear a little bit how you came to the game. And I know a little bit. I mean, one of you is from Baltimore, one of you is from the Bronx. So it's it's starting very soon. But uh, Ethelbert, why don't you start us off? You know, what brings you to the game? Because I'm reminded of a story Roger Angel told me years ago where he's like watching TV and um, I, I, you know, I believe the, the Yankees are playing, it might have been the World Series against the Pirates and Bobby, uh, you know, the home big, the big home run. And uh, he's calling his wife into the living room saying, I think something big's about ready to happen. And she goes, oh, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. And she doesn't make it in. Mm. And, and of course, Roger is, was a great baseball writer, huge fan. His wife never was. So mm. what, what, what latched on? What was the hook for you, Ethelbert? I think a combination of things, you know, in my neighborhood in the South Bronx, it was Stickball and Spaldines, you know, um, <laughs> Um, and that had a lot to do with the, my friends. Uh, one dear friend was a, a young girl, uh, came like, like my little girlfriend when I was uh, growing up, Judy Liu, who's Chinese, but she's like sort of like a, a tom girl, you know? <laughs> but we, we play baseball constantly, you know? Uh, and then the other thing was probably baseball cards. You know, I had a very large baseball card collection. Um, so between that and playing stickball and living not far from Yankee Stadium, um, you know, baseball was very real, you know, in my house. And, and I look back and I, and I realized, you know, you know, being a father and a grandfather, you know, um, my neighborhood in the South Bronx, there wasn't really any basketball court stands, you know. Um, and so it wasn't like, you know, I could play basketball, you know. Um, and so when I go back and look, I said, I was fortunate to grow up, you know, with stickball in a, a community that was Puerto Rican. You know, and I remember, you know, you 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 had uh, guys get together, and they um, it was they didn't play stickball. They played like little minor league baseball in the St. Mary's Park, and they had teams like Bustelo. You know, like after the call, so. you know, and, you know. I mean, just the name, you know, like Bustelo. You know, and we were on the field when they came. We just got off. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I yeah, that. we're done. <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 I say this, you know, in terms of, of what's beautiful about baseball. Um, baseball brought me together with young people who were for different nationalities. You know, one person, as I mentioned, my friend Judy, she was Chinese. The other person on this, on this note was a guy by the name of George Walker. And um, I met him like around my fifth or sixth grade. And George Walker was black. I mean, he was really, really dark. And he was really teased and ridiculed. Um, but he loved baseball. And so we became really good friends. And one thing I know is looking back, maybe because he, how he was treated, I'm rooting for Mickey Mantle and Whitey Ford. Every player that George was was supporting was Hank Aaron. They all were black. You know, <laughs> <laughs> this is before Black Studies. This is before you know the red, black, and green flag. And this is before Afros and Dashigis. But George, who was really dark, you know, it, all his heroes were black. And and you know, going back, I look. I said, you know, wow, you know, this guy really stood out in terms of that. But that's part of my education, and it also brought me to baseball and friends. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Dean, Baltimore. I mean, this is now we're before Camden. We're over at Memorial and, and such. So what's kind of resonating for you and, and even what players stood out for you? So we were living in the Courthouse Square Apartments in Towson and they had a clubhouse and all the parents gathered for the 69 World Series. And I was mm. five going on six. And when it ended, it was game four or five. When it Whenever it ended, I remember... I never forgot the image of all of those people flooding onto the field. And I turned around, I was alone in the clubhouse. No one was there. And that mm -hmm. sort of began, it was sort of a loss experience, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, from that point, about a, you know, a year later, my parents were divorced and I'd fallen in love with Paul Blair. Like mm -hmm. you, you just take the tennis ball, throw it against the wall, you know, try to catch like him with the one hand or bat like him. He had like a, a real slow, deliberate swing where he was just going to unleash at the, at the ball. And, you know, you know, when my parents separated, the Orioles became my surrogate parents. And I put that in an essay once my mother was furious, but like, <laughs> yeah, the Orioles raised you. And, but it was true because I could literally sit for three, however long those games were and listen to Chuck Thompson, watch Frank Robinson, Brooks Robinson, you know, you learn to play the field defensively, the way those guys did, you know, mimic them. That's how you, you kind of learned the game and you just followed, you'd get that little thing from crown gasoline to begin the season and you'd figure out which games are on TV, but you listen to all of them while doing your homework. And, you know, I just, just 
that, but, but it was, for me, it was like my, my dad went to coach basketball and my mom was working full time. She went and got her degree at Morgan. Then it was Morgan state. And, you know, the only thing I was really interested in at that moment was baseball. I mean, that was, it kind of saved me. It kind of, the fact that they were winning and they were so good in that 69 to 72, even when they'd come against the, the A's and the, you know, it was, you were looking at the two best teams in baseball, really. Um, like going to see Vida Blue and, and uh, you know, at Memorial Stadium and, and just, just th that whole thing. I just lived for, to be there because that, that ultimately took me out of that home situation too. So I was, you know, the pain sort of subsided a little bit when, when I was able, baseball helped me. It was very much a healing exercise for me. Yeah, it's I'm, I'm finding it interesting too. The Paul Blair was your favorite. I mean, such an audacious, mm -hmm. you know, outfielder. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember the first time I saw Paul Blair field, I went, "Hang on, hang on, he, he's out of position. He should be farther he, back." <laughs> he's, you know, and he, he, uh, the, just the catching the one hand the way he did did it. You know, mm -hmm. we would sort of try to mimic that. And my grandmother made a po a poster for me. I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. And it was Yankees beware, here comes Paul Blair. And we took that to the game, <laughs> you know, and then he ended up with, the, you know, he, he became a Yankee. And I think, you know, but yeah, so Bobby Mercer, I think, hit a home run that day. The Orioles won like 10 to four, but the day we brought that poster was, mm -hmm. you know. Well, you know, Dean, when you mentioned about loss, I, you know, it made me think about, you know, um, the other key thing in, in terms of my life was the 1960 World Series where Bill Mazeroski hits the home run. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of the Yankees against the Pirates, and that was a sense of loss. You know, uh, and and you 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 sort of like, whoa, okay. I guess if I was older, it'd be like Joe Lewis losing a fight, but you know, I was, just, right. <laughs> but it was this loss, and, and um, I, I can still I can still remember that. And and um, just recently, Ralph Terry died, uh, mm -hmm. and I didn't realize that he was also the pitcher. You know, who also threw the ball that you know Bobby Richardson caught. So he won. He had he got a second chance, you know, that they said in terms of uh, many people don't have that experience. You lose one World Series, but you also win another. <laughs> Ethelbert, who is your favorite player? My favorite player, you know, growing up, um, I remember, you know, I grew up with like a Mickey Mantle. But then one of the sure. people that I really liked was um, was Jim Bouton, you know, uh, because yeah. he was probably very um, fan friendly at that time. You know, this was it before ball four. Um, so I, I liked him. And then later on, uh, one of my favorite Yankees was Roy White. You know, mm -hmm. I liked him. And then now that I'm here in Washington, you know, um, some of my favorite players, you know, are no longer with the team. You know, like I was really into like Max and Trey Turner, who I really thought was really good. Uh, and so what happens now, I'm going into this baseball season, I finally have like, you know, the Major League Baseball app. And so, you know, I look up, I'll probably following a lot of more Dodger games. And, and, and also, and also, I guess what happened because, you know, I really, you know, this gets into the whole thing of baseball being a national game, but then how it's televised. I really don't, I really haven't seen Mike Trout play a lot, you know, um, the same way, you know, I stay up for the Golden State basketball games, you know, but I really didn't follow a lot of like the Dodgers and the Angels, you know. Uh, and so now with the app, I think I probably will be doing that more this baseball season. Wow. You're, you're going to have no time. You're not going to sleep. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> Dean, would you read us a poem, please? Sure. This is a poem about um, I, when I moved to Chicago, I really enjoyed going to the old Comiskey. And it was uh, it had some really unique features, especially uh, these cathedral windows that when the sun set, uh, you could see it on the south side, it would the sun would would come in. You could see it sometimes on the broadcast if they would pan around or somebody was making a foul ball catch, but it was this white light, very kind of uh, distinctive. And, um, but I was actually out there and, and got to see it before it was um, completely demolished. The Wrecking of Old Comiskey. Here's to the Windy City, built for the freezing of meats, where Speedway Wrecking, not Shoeless Joe, is the hardest hitter of all. In the city of the big shoulders, where bilious aldermen rule, the wrecking ball stands in the batter's box, smashing old Comiskey down. The tangled medusa of grandstands threatened to collapse on the crane. A screaming liner from Desert Storm blows the facade away. This new field of dreams resembles a Chicagoland mall without dolmen or rune, a merchandise mart for baseball. Fireworks signal a White Sox victory and the ruins echo with cheers, each burst above the silent green seats 
a promise of total destruction. Those large cathedral windows that once gorged the field with light, now they're the eyes of Polyphemus, scorched in vacant ciphers. When my cleats have reached the warning track and my innings are almost done, I hope heaven is a grand old ballpark with bleachers in the sun. <laughs> well, that's beautiful. Gorged by sunlight. I love that. And, and it, you, you know, I love that poem because it, you know, we've been talking players, we've been talking teams, but the place is, is hugely important. And I think with, you know, both of you guys, I mean, Memorial Stadium, old Yankee Stadium, I'm not that much of a fan of new Yankee Stadium, but place is important, you know, where we see it at, you know, I think all of us can remember the first time we walked in the ballpark and I, I never saw grass that green. You know, I thought I was in a different dimension or a different world or something. It's crazy. So, <laughs> uh, Ethelbert, will you please read us a poem? Okay. You know, I'm reading um, from this final collection of the, my baseball. And, and, and when is that due out? When, when Actually, will that, um, I probably will have copies of this book. Um, in June, physical copies, but the release oh, is actually in September. Uh, okay. And I'm very happy in terms of um, Tyler Kepman wrote a nice blurb for for the books. So I'm deeply grateful for that. And then the Port Merrill Leffler wrote a nice introduction. Uh, but I, you know, because I was dealing with a trilogy, uh, I wanted the books to be different. You know, so in this final book, there are more uh, poems about specific players, specific people, like I read the Ken Grippy. So this one is entitled Emmett Ashford, you know, who's the African-American umpire um, who died in 1980. And, you know, he had a certain flair, you know, <laughs> Emmett Ashford. I call balls and strikes the way John Coltrane plays my favorite things. Folks come to the game to hear the sound of my music. Some batters stand in the box like bass players who don't know how to play. If I'm not behind the plate, I'm dancing in the infield, calling runners out and safe like James Brown sliding across the stage. I've had managers run from dugouts on his protesting screen. Please, please, please. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I went back and, and I don't know how Dean writes, but you know, I went back, I was looking at footage uh, of him and you know that flair and especially especially when he was you know like out in the field calling calling running safe and it's sort of like a glide so I, I sort of look at James Brown gliding across the stage mm -hmm. um, but that's one of the things what I was trying to do was look at um, baseball from a lot of different angles you know um, umpires I went back and somebody who's like just carrying the bear through for seven nine innings you know I wanted to have that perspective uh, and then I wanted to have you know the the baseball speak you know, or the scoreboard speaks. So uh, I was always looking for the, these types of angles. And so that was Emmett Ashford. Yeah, that was great. You know, I think I'm going to do, especially with the season coming up, I can't stand commercials. So I think what I'm going to do is turn down the volume and have both your guys, you know, poetry books, and I'm just going to read a poem or something <laughs> between innings. Uh, you know, that, that, that could work pretty well, especially when we got new material coming out. So that's, that's great. Um, let's, you know, you know I, there's I, another side to there's another side to you know? <laughs> <laughs> that. Might, Dean might agree with me on that. Our teams may be that bad that we may want to reread. <laughs> 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 we may we want to bring a book to the ballpark. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, you know, Dean, Dean will hold up our books instead of a bag. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Instead of you know selling peanuts and beer, they should be selling you know books of poetry too. They, last year they did that one Ethel birthday. Um, they offered what I've always dreamed about was the park pass for like thirty five bucks at the end of the season. You could just go at any time. And I just when I lived close to the garden in Manhattan, I was like, I lived in Chelsea. Could you come up with a park pass so I could just pay and just go in there whenever I wanted? But the Orioles finally did that. It was unbelievable. I was like, man, and I wasn't there, but it was great. Today you'd be probably reminding Tim of Cuba. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> just a lot, of, a park. lot of park passes. Let's just walk <laughs> around. <laughs> Actually, the next trip to Cuba, I think I'm going to bring some of your books of poetry. Yeah? That, that puts you on the, I don't know, <laughs> some kind of list out there. But be careful if you ever go back. Um, well, so you we've know, got, uh, on a, on a go joke about that, um, a yeah. lot of my poems are, are translated into uh, Spanish in Cuba. Because one of the person who did my one of my blurbs is Nancy Morajan, 
Oh, okay. who was considered like the national poet of Cuba, and her her father was an umpire, you know. And and I have a picture of me and her at National Stadium, like, like cheering. Up. I'll send it to you. You know, we just you know, she's a that. real passionate baseball fan. You know? Well, you know what? You know, you know, I'm thinking is we've got to go to Cuba sometime. Maybe the three of us, may more, and we've got to go. You and Ethelbert, you and I have talked about this, but uh, skinny caliente, which means the hot corner where they have anywhere from 40 to 75 people, usually men, but some women, there a day. It's in the Central Park of Havana, and all they do is talk about baseball. We could just come and you guys could read and maybe have a translator, and it would be it'd be great till you know, right the, 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 <laughs> till the yeah. security came down and busted it up or something. <laughs> um, in other words, you were talking about Mike Trout um, and I'm thinking kind of the state of the game a little bit. We've got kind of a new season coming on board. Thank God we have a labor agreement as one who covered the labor debacle in 93, 94 and saw World Series canceled. I thought we were going off the cliff again. But, you know, your thoughts about baseball as a game and where it's kind of headed, you know, your assessment of just the national pastime today. Well, I think we have to look at baseball and we have to look at all our sports, I mean, whether it's women's soccer, whether it's basketball. We, we have a different type of athlete, you know, and we have an athlete that is not necessarily not going to to play forever. You know, um, we have many athletes who are business people. Uh, we have many athletes who are very much concerned about the workplace and the conditions, their health. And so what happens is that, you know, we can look at some of the players who are the representatives at these unions. And, and that's what's happening. You know, um, uh, baseball, if you look at some of the concerns, it's about, you know, what's happening in the minor leagues, what's happening to the young players. And those are the type of concerns that uh, I think um, across the sports, you know, and I look at, especially in terms of women's soccer, how that changed, you know, the, the, the situation. And I think what we're seeing in terms of baseball, um, more women are going to be coming into the game. You know, mm -hmm. as umpires or managers, you're going to see that. But it's many times people want to grow up not just to play the game, but, you know, become maybe a team owner, manager, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that really, that's really, when you listen, go back, that's Jackie Robinson's legacy, not just integrating, but he was really much concerned about, you know, um, you know, this ownership. And, and, and so, you know, that's still there uh, in terms of it has to be a goal. And what we see now, and, and I go back to Jeter, what he was doing with, with the Marlins when he was there, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we have to really make sure that our biases um, don't come into the game. You know, for example, we have to make sure that we have teams where if you're going to be there, you're going to have to be bilingual, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And then what happens, we have to make sure that people are not stiff, like, show, show that, show, show that. You know, what happens is that you might recall, even when Ichiro was around, it was this whole thing that um, Japanese players were too small to play the game and things mm -hmm. of that sort, you know? Well, why do you have to compare somebody to Babe Ruth? Why can't they just be who they are? Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 sure, you know, um, he can hit, he can pitch. You know, well, I looked at Deion Sanders playing baseball and and and, <laughs> and football on the same day. You know, so what happened? These new athletes, you know, are going to change sports, and when they change sports, they're going to change America. Hmm. Oh, that's cool. That's cool, Dean. You what you grazing your your crystal ball for me a little bit and and you're actually you got to show the viewers this shirt this this shirt is amazing <laughs> <laughs> wow that's 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 good and yet i i fear for your team in, in some places <laughs> yeah you know I, I mean uh there's not a lot of places you can wear this and i'm so glad to be on this zoom <laughs> with you uh you know i i look at it in my drawer and i'm like when is it going to happen because it's you 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 can you know living up in Ithaca, New York, not a lot of venues for the Brooks Robinson shirt, but definitely uh, this is one of the. I'm glad to, the Zoom room is the perfect uh, the perfect place. I was really worried though. I mean, when the strike you know looked like there was you know the they were having some issues, and I remember '94, and I think we're in a different place in terms of what the youth are doing at the moment and what they're paying attention to. You know, my son. My son was like the Rex Hudler of baseball. He had the hat on backwards. He had, nothing was tucked in. You know, he 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 just did it. He did it his own way. Never, and he only played for a few years, but he never listened. It, it, and I'll tell you, he he actually in one little league game hit three grand slams in a row. 
it was uh, he, <laughs> so that's Jim, that's Jim Gentile, right? There. <laughs> no, I know. Because uh, give the week him the before, shirt. The Orioles will sign him right now. <laughs> the week before, we driven past uh, Williamsport, and he saw the Little League Baseball Hall of Fame, and he goes, "Dad, how do you get into there?" And I said, "Well, you got to you got to do something extraordinary." Literally three weeks later, it was coach pitch, mind you, but still, that's twelve RBIs in one in one uh, in one game, but. You know, in watching him, he just kind of moved over to lacrosse. He, there was never a sign that he listened to. He ran through all the signs. I don't even think he was ever thrown out, but he just, like you're saying, these athletes, bigger, faster, stronger, mm-hmm. um, and, and wanting something different for themselves. And I think, yeah, absolutely. And that sport's probably, you know, in terms of ownership and where it is, my dad used to always say baseball owners weren't, weren't the brightest in the lot, you know, and, and it, it always seemed to me too that, there was some collusion between Selig and Steinbrenner, you know, like I kept thinking, um, you know, I remember I went to a game uh, at Yankee stadium once it never even rained, but doc Gooden's arm needed to be rehabbed. <laughs> and they, and there were the people behind me had come from driven all night from some state in the Midwest, Milwaukee, Minnesota, somewhere. Uh, and they got to get the game called off. And I was just like sitting there thinking, there's something and it never actually rained. They could have played that game. No problem. But it was Doc Gooden's arm. So, mm-hmm. you know what you're talking about in terms of the physicality and, and all of that fine tuning of the conditioning. And, you know, I, I don't I, you know, if I look at the crystal ball, I, I don't you know, I'm I, with with what the Orioles have done. I've had to try and find some other things to, to be interested in. You know, mm-hmm. for me, that the story is what's going to happen with Buck Showalter. I want to see what's going to happen with the Mets and how he handles the, those players and some of the, the veterans and the young players up there. But I mean, I'll, you know, for me, it's also the Cape Cod baseball league, go up and check that out or go mm-hmm. try to find, uh, you know, you know, I, I sat and read the newspaper. I snuck into the old bull Durham stadium where they filmed the, mm-hmm. the movie and just, you know, I just like being in a ballpark, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, but I don't know, I don't know how viable with, you know, you've got lacrosse now appearing on television more and more for the youth, you know, how, how do you preserve that, um, you know, that thing and, and defense was always one of my big things. And, um, I remember talking to Paul Blair once where he was saying, nobody cares about their defense anymore. They just want to, they just want to hit the ball. So, sure. yeah. What's that, what's that launch angle or something like that? Well, let us, let's project that out a little bit. I mean, I've talked with both of you guys about this in a little bit different ways, but you know, a generation ago, a little bit more than a generation ago, your top sports for what? Baseball, boxing, horse racing, I believe. You know, football hadn't had the big rise yet. Um, baseball is still kind of there, but what do you expect? Where do you expect baseball to be in a generation? You know, you expect it to be among that, you know, uh, rarefied air, so to speak. Well, I think that baseball is is going to be international. You know, I mean, right now there's it's attempts to really get uh, people in Africa to play baseball. You know, uh, I, I think the international thing is gonna, gonna happen. And with that um, will come a lot of pressures the same way when Jackie Robinson was breaking in. Whatever ethnic group that player represents, that country is gonna be behind, you know? Uh, and, that, and, and you can see from some of these owners, they're thinking internationally. The NFL is thinking internationally. Mm-hmm. You know, they got Brady shirts ready to be sold in Germany, you know, this next season, you know? Uh, and so that's gonna be the future. You know, and also the thing that I feel um, needs to be looked at, and this has got touching economics. You know, some of the things that came out of this this lockdown, we said we really reduced the size of the minor leagues, mm. okay? which means we're really reducing how many players will want to stick it out to make it to the majors. Okay, that might wind up giving rise to an expansion of minor league teams. You say where people say, okay, I'm going to play. You know, after work, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I love, like, I love the game. And all of a sudden you look up, that's, you grow up in a town or a city, you know, which has a really nice ballpark, you know, South Bend, Indiana, or, or, or someplace mm-hmm. like, you know, Dayton, Ohio, and, and you, you love the game, you know, you don't really go to Cincinnati or whatever, you know, um, uh, with your family, but you love the game and, and that market and that audience increases. And then because of social media, you can follow um, the game wherever they are, you know? And I think that's what will happen is that the same way you see people following the war through their phones and stuff, you're gonna find if somebody might be a kid somewhere playing baseball, setting records, like, you know, Dean, like this, and, and all of a sudden you're following that person, like he was Joe DiMaggio. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Dean, thoughts on that? Future a little bit? 
uh, do you do you agree it's going to be is international kind of the saving saving grace on this? I mean, I think that's yeah, that it could be. I, I when. I was thinking about how the Orioles at one point had no international scouts and then they added a couple and then now it's come, it's come back a little bit, but yeah, I mean, I always, I'd always thought that like Germany would be a great place to have baseball players. You've got the beer and the hot dogs and like, <laughs> and like the body, it's like the weather's always cloudy. You know, you've got that. There's a kind of the natural inborn slugger there. Um, it hasn't quite panned out, but I've always thought that that would be kind of a cool, cool thing to do and um, have it go over there. I mean, England still hasn't come on. I mean, they've got cricket. There's still the cricket thing that goes on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you're, you're I, you talking know, about those old players like a kid, Ted Kaczynski. Or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Harmon Killebrew. Killebrew. You, know, <laughs> you know, like, a, you know, you could you could see, you know, like a Schultz version of a cleanup hitter. Coming <laughs> right, right. But, uh, no, I, th- I think that's that's viable. Certainly. I mean. You know, Ethelbert's is kind of in both of those answers. He's sort of he, he's he's done a lot of thinking about this, and um, you know, I'm just sort of you know, the lockdown. I was praying for a base, some kind of something to watch there. <laughs> you yeah, know, really, no well, spring training. You got to be kidding me. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dean, go up, do us go a step further with your son uh, Quinn, because I'm thinking of my son Chris, who, who's older. My, my son Chris is 29. He was a catcher in Little League, American Legion, all that type of thing. Um, Chris loves baseball, but he doesn't really watch the regular season. He only kind of comes back on, it comes back on his radar screen when it's the postseason and mm-hmm. such. I mean, do you see Quinn still following the game, even though he's uh, you know, a lacrosse football guy now? Do you see him coming back to it in some way? Only if it's on TikTok in some way. And, and they, do have, <laughs> they do have on TikTok, like the pitchers throwing 90 miles an hour. So there's some, some videos that are going on with that. Right. But it's interesting because, you know, there's been a couple of times where we got a lot of the data. You mentioned baseball cards. And actually, the cover of my book is a baseball card. Mm-hmm. It's Andrew Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, the painting is, is, is painted over a baseball card. And, you know, we got all of that data. We memorized the data. We memorized lineups. You know, I could still probably recite the 70s Orioles lineup. Right. And, you know, it was very clear to me that I needed to go to the newspaper or to um, to the baseball cards for the information. And, and he'll ask these questions and I'll just say, hey, you know, you got to do the work, you know, if we're watching mm-hmm. him. But it usually happens around playoffs or the World Series where he's interested. But, you know, the, the work is not there. You know, that kind of discipline in terms of how you learn about a game mm-hmm. is, you know, they can YouTube anything they want. And, you know, they're. I think much more visual learners. I have no idea, but just there's not that, hey, uh, you, you know, because if it were if I were watching with my dad, I wouldn't ask him those questions. That's basically mm. what I had to tell him at one point, <laughs> because I was my father and I watched the Orioles game. There's no sound in the room <laughs> unless there's a at, a at a commercial, you know, then then you might say something. But I was like, you know, don't do that around your grandfather. <laughs> basically. <laughs> Yeah, so. uh, and and but you brought up the minor leagues, which I think is a really good point because you know, you know, it's an access, it's a way for more players to play. But I think it's also a way for more fans to get into the game. Um, I used to take my kids to a lot of minor league games, and I and when I did so, I didn't, I wasn't computing in my head when I took them to an Orioles game or even later on a Nationals game and going, oh, they want to leave in the sixth inning. Okay, how much am I, how much just went out the window here in terms of cost? Um, minor league games are great. And I remember taking my, minor my league games, yeah, yeah, minor league they're games just are great. So, they're not only great, but they're so important for economies in some of these cities. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's, you know, um, it's for some people, especially like, say, for example, seniors, you know, it's like a part-time job or maybe you're, you're a vendor or you're selling t-shirts or something like that. Or somebody just comes to your bar or something like that after the game, you mm-hmm. know, you can't take away that, you know, uh, and, and feel that, you know, the city's going to have that vitality. Yeah. Yeah. My mom was not a baseball fan growing up, but I took her to a minor league game actually in Buffalo years ago, first game. And she, you know, she went to hockey games, she went to football games, university of Michigan, all this stuff. And, and she was the first couple of innings just, intense you know she was like following it like you would a football game and finally about the third inning she looks around it was a bunch of us and she goes i get it now 
And I go, what would he get, Mom? <laughs> she said, we're going to sit around and watch this game, and we're going to talk and have beer and hot dogs. And I'm going, that's it. <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> the world's so wonderful. You just see her just go, oh, I like this. <laughs> so maybe maybe we'll get so wound up as a world at some point. We'll go, mm-hmm. no, the only way I can relax, so I got to go to a baseball game. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. You, you bring that up because I remember that, the going to the game after the Jeffrey Mayer game, you know, I'm an Orioles fan and, and Jeffrey Mayer <laughs> reached out and did what he did. And the next, the, 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 the atmosphere in the next game was like a football game. I mean, it was mm-hmm. intense, that kind of intense. Uh, and it was the playoffs. I get it, but I, you know, there was security everywhere. It was, oh. um, there was a kind of tension that was even beyond just be, mm-hmm. because of, I, I you know, I, I don't, you know, there've been a couple of baseball games like that, that, that I've been to where it's, it's felt like that. And, you know, anytime the Yankees, the Orioles would play, mm-hmm. if it was, if something was at stake or at Memorial stadium, when you're a pennant drive, but mm-hmm. you know, you definitely know it. There's relaxation most of the time, but there can be some, or, or I imagine an angels Dodgers game in, in <laughs> Anaheim or, or something like that. You know, I, I encountered it I actually did see trout play in his rookie season out there. And it was like that. I mean, it was that intense. But you know what's missing when you talk about that intensity and you talk about that rivalry, you might recall this is when they were talking about rescheduling where, you know, you have the Yankees play the Mets and stuff like that. That sounded nice, but because the, many players have no loyalty, you know, you got the Brooks Robinson jersey, the players, you know, don't have any loyalty. They move around. So that really, you know, anima- you know, you could be hating somebody one year and then they're on the down, they got the same. And then they're on your team. So, so it's not <laughs> like it's a rivalry for like five years, you've been beating somebody over, you know? But it, and, and so it's hard to like sort of have uh, that passionate rooting unless, you know, you like cities like Philadelphia, or, you know, something like that. And then what happens now? Now, um, some of the cities that used to be losers have become winners. Okay, right. so we, so it's completely different. I mean, and, and I don't think you have the same type of fan out in Seattle, <laughs> you know, Mariner fans that are going to be really passionate about yeah, we won we won the World Series, <laughs> you know. So it's it's going to have a lot to do with that sort of how you package March Madness. You know, that sort of real concern about, you know, every time somebody brings the ball down, you know, I mean, I'm really into the look, looking at the UConn women's basketball team, you know, because, oh, yeah. you know, Quite what's happening is that you have a player that were young, they're energetic. And that type of thing is why you look up and say, OK, who are the major league players who bring that Soto, others, you know, that sort of thing. And that's a package. And this is where the, the major league baseball has to make sure they don't do what the NFL does. You can't tell a Latino player how to reduce his backflip, okay? That's like <laughs> that's like banning the drum in Congo Square for black people during slavery. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You just, you just don't do that. The same way the whole thing with the end, the end zone dances. You know I mean? Every, people are choreographing that, you know what I mean? That's gonna be a show. And, and so what happens, if you wanna hold that audience, they're gonna have to do that. You know, now I'm not gonna talk, you know, let's bring back Warren Marischal throwing, being, you know, Rose, Johnny Rose upside the head, but there's a certain way of energy that especially Latino players are bringing to the game, you know, that I think, you know, I don't know if you really want to regulate that. Mm-hmm. No, I don't think you want to at all because the passion they bring into it is, is amazing. So, and it's funny. I mean, you, you guys are talking about loyalty and roots. Um, I'm flashing back to an interview I did with George Brett when he was still playing and, and we we're just talking and, you know, here's well accomplished guy. I mean, all these awards, blah, blah, blah. And I just said, well, what, you know, championships, what's the one moment you're the most proud of and what stunned me. And I, first of all, I couldn't believe he had this. We're talking by his locker stall. He reached up in the top of his locker stall and he had a stack of his own player cards. We're back to playing <laughs> cards and he pulled it down and gave it to me. but just said, look at the back. And when it was all the Royals, he says, that's what I'm the most proud of. And I went, wow, you know, this mm. is something you're not going to see much more. And we don't, you know, it's, it's, you know, the world has changed and, uh, you know, we're gearing up for another season and I've got to figure out who's on what team a little bit. And I used to cover this whole crazy thing. Um, let's close. I'd love to close with another poem from both you guys. And Dean, you're, you're going to bat lead off this time and, uh, and, and we'll close it out. This is great. Now, I don't have to work very hard. I just listen to poetry. <laughs> I'm, I'm torn as to what to read. So oh, you can read them both if you want. <laughs> well, it's, 
So um, I know the one I'm rooting for, but that's oh, which one is that? Oh, the Flanagan one. What people don't realize is, and Dean, I can't let you, I can't believe you let me do this. Um, with the audio book for Baltimore Suns, I narrated it. And I felt like Dean had given me the keys to like this brand new sports car and I was going to drive it into a tree. And it was so, so and, 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 I, and, and you guys are poets. poets. I didn't realize this. I'm, I'm more prose guy, obviously. And, and, and Dean sends me this collection, beautiful collection. And I'm going, oh, what do we got here? We've got about, what was it like 60 some poems? I'm going, I'll knock this out in like a week or something. <laughs> and, and I would do like two or three, four, maybe in a day. And I looked like I was like on stage with the Rolling Stones. I was drenched <laughs> in sweat. I was exhausted. And, and my wife kept going, are you okay? And I'm going, these poems are killing me. <laughs> you know, Because <laughs> it's not like you can just Cadillac through it. You, you got to put some passion into it. So anyway, I, I, I will be forever in your honor for letting me read your poems. You know, Ethelbert, I, I picked up um, Ross Gay's book, uh, Beholding, about, it's a epic poem about Dr. J and about making the move, a couple of those moves. Mm -hmm. I thought I could just sit there and just like you said, Tim, I thought I could just read it all the way through and man, there's no possible way that you can do that, you know, and, and uh, uh, not with either one of your guys' poems. I mean, forget uh, it. But I was interested in that, definitely interested in the topic. So I'll, I'll read final out. <laughs> a wicked sweeping curve drops off the table and nips the outside corner unhittable enough to win you a Cy Young the same year you outdueled Seaver and Old Comiskey with a beguiling yellow hammer that twirled from your southpaw fingers and vanished into the catcher's mitt as you glared like Wild Bill Hickok at the batter, hair swinging under your cap as you punched them out and years later looking clean cut, downcast as you walked slowly off the mound after getting the last out at Memorial Stadium. We never knew about the dark spaces haunting your retirement, disguised by a New England wit, saltier than a Cape Cod potato chip, a voice we craved on TV broadcasts, or a front office job that never suited you as you ran the team after the magic died on its way downtown, and you were cast aside with your friend, Elrod Hendricks, and became despondent because you were really born to be a pitching coach. And after 14 years of losing, you started hitting the package goods store without a clue that everyone knows what's going on in Baltimore. And people saw you with pint sized paper bags. Mm -hmm. On a beautiful day for baseball, a shadow covering the pitcher, pitching mound of your soul. And you pointed a shotgun at your face and pulled the trigger. The former ace of the pitching staff, bleeding out the pain of a losing franchise into the withered August grass. And later, your former teammates paid homage on the broadcast. Jim Palmer and Rick Dempsey crying on the air. Your downtrodden birds, down two outs in the ninth, came back to defeat the Red Sox a few weeks later on a miraculous night only your ghost could have had a hand in. Ousting your childhood team from the playoffs and your number 46 on a banner just under the press box that night and at the Legends Museum by the exit sign because you left us way too soon before it all got better one season later and the team started winning again on its way to a pennant and when i think of you on the mound i hear chuck thompson's voice after you retired the side with a swing and a miss mike flanagan struck him out yeah that's beautiful i was shot for days after reading that one and and also because um you know you love you loved flanagan as a player flanagan was just so good to me you know, as a reporter, you know, he, he was a phenomenal, phenomenal person. Oh, hey, Ethelbert, you want to close us out? Uh, you want to bring us home? We're going to round the bases with this. Round the bases. I'll read the title poem of my, of, of my next book, okay. How I Found Love Behind a Catcher's Mask. All my life, I've caught hell. I never wanted to be a catcher. When meeting a woman, I never know what signs to put down. I never have enough protection. Once a girlfriend told me she was pregnant. She lied, but I didn't know it. A man can only see so much. I live a life of blueness, 
behind my mask of Buddha's smile of suffering. Before dying, it's important to play catch with yourself. You don't have to wait for a woman to throw love at you. Huh. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I think Baseball Pandemic Book Club will never do another one like this. This is this is awesome. Could I ask, a, a, could I ask Dean one thing? Um, is oh, he please. Willing to, are you willing to play third base for the Nationals this year? <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought you were going to ask me that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. you, better, you better channel your inner Brooks Robinson. Zimmerman that, is no though. longer there, right? I mean, did, no, did they... no, he's retired. So, um, yeah. Well, he was first base. Yeah, yeah, that's a wide open. Drop a truck through it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's be nice. An, it's really an honor to be with you, Ethelbert and Tim. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really wonderful. <laughs> yeah. oh, great. Thank you very much.